Hi, this is Patty Negri. Welcome to The Witching Hour. This week we have another wonderful guest, and a local, another L.A. local girl like me, witch and occultist Ashley Ryan. But before we get to Ashley, where is Patty? My broom is in overdrive right now, I have to tell you. But if you are listening to this when we first drop the week of October 5th, 25th, what? October 25th? What? It's Halloween. What? It's Samhain. Yes, count down the days. It is our time of the year. You guys, magic is everywhere. You might be getting some extra knocks on your doors, under the bed, and spirits going by because the veil is thin. So have fun whatever you practice, whatever you participate, whether it's trick-or-treating with your kids, you're doing seances, you're doing Samhain, you're doing Dia de los Muertos. Just have fun because the spirits are with you, no matter what you think. Um, So this week, if you are listening to this on the 25th, that means I just got back from a para experience in Lake Tahoe. It was fabulous. You know, time and space, as you know, I'm taping this a few days before I go, but it was fabulous. Um, Jamie Lee, it's beautiful. We're at a beautiful old haunted Biltmore, Biltmore in South Lake Tahoe. And this upcoming week, I will be in... New Orleans. Yep, it is time for the really big Endless Night Vampire Ball New Orleans. We have days and days of dancing and rituals and seances for the dead, of course, and very fancy convivium dinners. So if you don't have plans for Halloween week, join us in New Orleans. Lots of information there. If you want to stay around your computer or your phone, on my Tuesday class, I'm going to be teaching kitchen magic because we are going into fall and we are going into... Well, we're well into fall, but we're going into times you might cook more, more than just your summer salads. It's a great time. It's harvest time. And even though my husband won't let me in the kitchen, even though I was kicked out of home ec in high school, I've still won awards for cooking and I've still cooked for Gordon Ramsay on Magic Chef and on Master Chef. And how I did that was with magical cooking. So you don't have to be a good cook. If you're interested in a kitchen magic, whether it's how to stir your coffee in the morning or your kids' instant oatmeal, sign up at my new school, universitymagicus.com. University, U-N-I-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y-M-A-G-I-C-K-U-S. Dot com. Lots of other great teachers, but check it out. Tuesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, Kitchen Magic. Join us. Um, other than that, I think that's everything because really my broom is tired. It doesn't even get to charge up in the electric charger. I've been gone three or four days every single weekend since I can remember. Lifetimes, I think. Before we get into our magic lesson of the day... I want to talk a little bit about my paranormal. Do you guys know about our win the Hotel Cecil sign? Yep. You can win the Hotel Cecil sign from the real Hotel Cecil. You have to know about it. Well, if you're watching my show, you know about it. Whether you saw the Netflix show or whether you watched Ghost Adventure Special or whether you watched the TFIL boys or watched anybody else who can get in there. It's really haunted. So what better to have for your house than the Hotel Cecil sign? So go to myparanormal.net, sign up for the contest, check it out, and uh, maybe you could have this very desirable piece of haunted history in your house. And speaking of my paranormal, I am so excited to tell you. Yep, yep, I had an extra three minutes a day, so I'm going to launch a new podcast. Yep, yep, yep. I, you guys all go, it's great. I talk about all this witchy stuff. We learn things and education and great guests, but a whole bunch of you go, well, what about the ghosty stuff? I want to see the scary stuff and the ghosty stuff for just for all you folks. I am going to introduce to you Patty Negri's haunted journal. Yep. You will find it on my paranormal as my home base, of course, myparanormal.net. And then you can find it everywhere that you listen to podcasts. But I'm having so excited. I'm going to be telling you my what really happened stories of ghost hunts and television and non-television and everything in between on my haunted journeys around the world. So stay tuned for Patty Negri's Haunted Journal. Bum, bum, bum. Do I get some music here? No. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Patty Negri, and time for my favorite time and hers, the Willow Report. Yep, 
This little black baby bundle of right love is Willow. Her belly hair is growing back in from being fixed. But I must say, as you know, I'm in my busy season right now. I'm on the road three or four days a week, every single week, for months now and for, well, a while to come. So my husband is taking care of her all by herself. And you know, he's just not as good or disciplined as a parent as I am, which is a scary thought in itself. But... um it's gotten a little scary around here. Want to see my favorite Uggs? They didn't used to be open-toe shoes. They really weren't open-toe shoes. The wall is chewed. Everything is chewed. She's the funniest little girl, but she still brings us so much joy. As soon as we get through Halloween and all the magic they're in, I'm definitely going to have to get a professional trainer. So if you know of a great professional trainer in the Los Angeles area, please let me know. Um, she, she flunked out of Petco Puppy School, as you all know, and it was a grand teacher, and there's only two dogs in the class, and the other one was much younger, so should not have done as good as she did. But no, she's a, she's a puppy school failure, so I need to get a private trainer because she really needs to know the basics, like come and stay and know and uh, don't eat all my shoes, please. But that's it for the Willow Report. I can't even hold her because she has just crashed out on the floor below me. Um, but you need a dog, too. If you're thinking you need a dog and you're thinking about a dog or a cat, maybe you need a cat. Um, the rescue of the week is the Animal Compassion Team. It's in actually Fresno, which is central California, but they get and give dogs and cats from everywhere. It's, uh, I must say, and I'm proud to say, that it is run by my stepdaughter, my husband's daughter. She was an, It's weird to say stepdaughter because she was a, an adult when we met, um, but my stepdaughter, Tracy Crutchfield. And it's this great, big, beautiful facility. It's this 12,000 square foot facility that used to be animal testing for, a, for um, D Davis College up there, like cows and things. But they've turned it into a no-kill shelter and painted walls. And there's amazing cat rooms, like huge rooms with like 40 cats, 30 cats, and every cat toy you would ever want. They're loving. They have runs. No one's in cages. Um, they get dogs from other places, or and they send dogs to places that we want. I, I'm, I'm making up the exact areas, but like Oregon wants big dogs, say, and they'll ship some big dogs, and some place doesn't want little cats, and they ship them here. Um, but they are doing so very well. So look up, it's called ACT, Animal Compassion Team. They also do things like teaching spade and neutering, because a lot of people in that Central California area um, just aren't as up to date about spaying and neutering and animal care as, as some other areas are. They still, dogs are dogs and they're on the street. So go find yourself a new pet, either ACT or anywhere else. There's lots that need adoption. Thank you so much for listening to the, I'm not even holding Willow, Willow Report. <laughs> Magic lesson for the day. I thought I would talk about animal familiars. Um, because everybody talks about familiars and witches have familiars. And you think about the classic witch's cat as a familiar. But there's actually three different kinds of familiars you can have. Yes, you can have the living familiars, which is the witch's cat, or that little shih tzu you have that you guys can read each other's mind. You have all this, mm, me and my dog are more than me and my dog, and sometimes it's even your bird or your ferret or your cat. So living animals can be where you have more than just your pet. It's a psychic connection. They seem to know if you're doing spiritual or magical things, they come in. They seem to know and judge you if you're not in a bed, good place or you're not doing your best stuff. So if you think you have a, I have lots of different ways you can check to see if you have a magical animal, but the best way is get down on the ground or get that bum on your level, look into their eyes and connect, get into their breathing if you can, share your brain a moment. It sounds really funny, um, your family members or roommates might put you away, but you can connect into your animal, your spirit animal, and you can really decide if this is your familiar, but you probably know it is anyway. You probably know it is anyway. Um, so whether it's a bird or a ferret or a cat or a dog, Enjoy it if you have a spirit animal. They are your magical partner. They will help you travel between the worlds.
Now, a second kind of spirit animal is the more etheric kind, the astral kind, the uh, spirit animal. That's getting more into like the Native American totem animals. I relate with crow or wolf or bear medicine, owl medicine. Now, those are given to us where the first animal, the living spirit animal, they kind of find us. They might show up at our, our doorstep or, or at the shelter going, this is the one for me because they called us in. So they, they, they come to us on the spirit animal um, or they just find us. With the spirit animal, they kind of are given to us by spirit, God, gods, whatever you believe in. Um, you may have a taking to it, whether it's crows or this obsession with, who knows, elephants, wolves, coyotes, lizards, snakes, you know, and they turn up everywhere. Maybe not in real life. I know somebody who has polar bear, not going to find a lot of polar bears walking around, but the magazine, she opens up and there's polar bears. So whether you've done it in a meditation time or you're just going, there is something a little synchronistic, my obsession with snakes, lizards, polar bears, that may be one of your etheric spirit animals. That's a good thing to get to know in meditation time. Definitely look it up. Let spirit, let your higher self tell you what the meaning for it is for you. These animals are given to you to teach you lessons. Either you're like the wisdom of an owl or the, the snickiness of a snake or the, the wiliness of a coyote. Literally, the things that you think about that the attributes these animals have are ones that we are given that maybe we need more of or they're one of our strong suits. So where the spirit animals living, your dog, your cat, they help us travel through the realms. They are our working partner. These others are like teachers, teachers of our magical, what we want to learn. Those can change in time too. Um, I did a meditation last night in my animal familiars class that we, we built the totem and, and whether you have bear or owl and see what order they're in. It, it's really interesting to see and it starts telling stories of, ah, these are my lessons and I understand why. And I understand when I was a little kid, why this and why that. So that is the second kind of spirit animal. And the third kind of spirit familiar is the created kind, the self-created kind. And for those of you who know me very well, you know about dragons. So a dragon is a created spirit animal. Um, we literally created ourselves. We create spirits all the time. Spirit of success, spirit of failure, spirit of I can't do it, spirit of I'm tired, spirit of magic, rub the Buddha's belly, the lucky cat in the Chinese store. Well, dra a dragon is a spirit, created real living spirit. You are creating a fetish, which is a real living entity out of an inanimate object. You know, it's a golem in Hebrew, it's an egregore, it's a servitor, it's a tulpa, lots of names. So when th those are animals, those are your animal created. In traditional British witchcraft, they don't put their familiars in their cats because they're going, cats kind of hate this sometimes. It's like, no, I don't want to sit and do magic. I'm a cat. You know, even though some do, they literally get a skull and they put their familiar into a bone. That's another that's created within it. But if you're working with animal and a create an animal, know that that is one of your animal familiars. So you might have all three. They might be the same for life. They might be ever changing. So your spirit animals can be the real living, usually house pet type, the totem animals, the spirit animals, as in eagle, lizard, alligator. I, I've heard some really wild ones or your self-created spirit animals. So go find yourself some. I don't know. They're going to find you. And today I've got somebody really special for you that I've just got to know a little bit and I can't wait to get to more. She's a local L.A. girl like myself. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Ashley Ryan. Ashley is a writer, producer, and initiated priestess. She has been practicing magic for over half her life. Ashley has earned a B.A. in philosophy and theology, and which propelled her deeper into her magical world, where she was a professional ghost hunter for two years. Ashley teaches witchcraft at the occult online as Pythian Princess and Pythian Mystery Skill to Hope School. Pythian Mystery School to help those find and responsibly walk their spiritual path. Thank you, Ashley, for coming on. Thank you for having me. And I apologize, but it's Pythian, like the Pythian. priestess. Yes. So I'll give you a little bit just of history before we... Please move. give me a little bit of history. You're so Pythian princess. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm this Pythian princess. 
So Pythian priestess, she was a actual person. She was a priestess of Apollo in ancient Greece. And we know about her because of Plato and Socrates. She was the an oracle between worlds. So very famous people like generals, kings would go to her looking for answers. Now, unfortunately, most of these people used her for mundane reasons, like who is my wife cheating on me with or how will I win this battle? And what was so great is that she would inhale these volcanic fumes and go into a frenzy and would actually like shout these bizarre answers at them that were mostly riddles. And when I learned about her in 2013, it had just been confirmed that she was real and not a mythology or something that came from mythology. It was really inspiring. Wow, that's beautiful. Because I do not know that story. I do not know her. She's not one of my, my little goddess book of whoever. Pythian priestess, you are. So I'm going to get it right this time. Well, thank you for that. So you just kind of related unto her and decided you would go with that path of sorts? Yeah. When I was in undergrad, I was studying the philosophy of religion to understand why humans need religion. And it came a story about her. And I was like, whoa, first of all, priestesses are real. That was like my first major, like very exciting moment. We'll get into that story in a second. Yeah. But when I learned that like this woman was revered as a spiritual leader, that's when I was like really fascinated. And also there were three of them. So there was Pythia, who was the, like the head priestess, and there are two, two other priestesses. Now these were not virginal girls. These were women who were just pulled from society, uh, deemed by Apollo. So they could have been mothers, uh, older women, even elders. And they were just, the priest of the temple would say that you have been chosen and they got pulled from their life. They lead everything behind and go live in a cave. Wow. Wow. I'd be going, I'm not sure. No <laughs> air conditioning I, at home. <laughs> right, air conditioning. I don't know if I want to live in a, in a cave, but they were so, so revered. And that was just honorable to me because I've always wanted to be a priestess. Uh, when I was four years old, I, I grew up with two nuns in my family and they asked me, they're like, do you want to be a nun? And I was like, no, I want to be a priest. And they told me I couldn't because I wasn't a boy. Ah, and priestesses are real. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, that is beautiful. And I love, um, well, go back in, because you said you had a beautiful story about something you wanted to tell, because then I want to go into something from your bio. Okay. <laughs> So that was like my big thing growing up. Um, I grew up in a really religious household. I mean, the most austere Catholicism where my my whole family, my whole life revolved around Catholicism. And it was, for me, really frustrating to learn that like I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things. Like I went to be an altar server and it was very stressful. There wasn't a lot of, like I didn't feel called to do it. When I do a lot of my priestess work now, I have a lot of understanding and I, it feels natural. This didn't feel natural at all. And I'm sure, Patty, you've been to the Green Man, haven't you? Oh, In a Los billion Angeles. times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I actually did one of their vision quests, which is like a, a, a group astral projection together, and that's when I had my like my mini initiation with Anubis and I was able to connect with that entity. And, and for those of you who don't know, Anubis is the gatekeeper uh, between worlds and Egyptian mythology. And I completed my test as a priestess by helping guide a soul to the other side who had died um, unexpectedly and very quickly. And I was blessed with an Ankh and an Ankh is many things, but most of all a key between worlds. That is beautiful. Yes, I've had some amazing vision quests um, with Griffin and everybody at Green Man. So LA folks, if you're looking for a really beautiful occult store, uh, Green Man is one of the best, definitely. So thank you for that. One thing I really like, I love that you have a school because I teach too. I'm a teacher and that's just so important to me. But that you write in your bio, you put with the word responsibly, responsibility, responsibly walk your walk. Because I think that's what makes us, stands us different following the craft, following the path that we do. We have to take responsibility for ourselves versus somebody's going to forgive you for doing this or seven Hail Marys or something. Yeah, I completely agree. Being a witch means you have power. And having power to manipulate energies it requires a lot of responsibility. And 
I teach, I don't teach baneful magic. I don't teach curses or hexes because, not because I believe in the rule of three, but because that's not what this power should be used for. Uh, this power is used to help and to heal and to bring people into the the other side, into spirituality. And I think that, you know, one of Donald Michael Craig, who's one of my favorite occultists, yes. he wrote uh, in his theorems of magic that every action has a magical reaction. So even if you don't believe in the law of three, whatever energy you put out there, it's going to come back to you. So we have to be responsible with what we're putting into the world. I agree. And I've never even had a reason to have to do any hexing or cursing because you have to live in that world. I've with positive magic, I'm exactly the same. I have no reason to ever do it. I wouldn't do it. It is about live in love, you guys. And and I've still been able to get and create miraculous things all working with positive magic. So I love that that's what you do and that's what you teach because that's what we need more of in this kind of crazy world we have right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's really easy to be hurt because hurt people hurt other people. And it's so important to learn to heal yourself. And that's most important is when you heal yourself, you will then be able to heal others. And that's what our world needs is a big Band-Aid. Big Band-Aid. Big, big, big. You know, because, you know, we've all been sent to our room to figure it all out because I think we were all asleep at the wheel. Not all of us, obviously, but as, as a general whole people. Um, so what are some things that people can do if they're listening? Again, people who listen to my show, and then we're going to have to talk about your show as well. Um, you know, there are obviously people seeking or searching or on the path or on a spiritual path of some sort. What are some of your uh, tips and ideas? Because I like tips and ideas for living in this world and keeping that balance and taking your responsibility to create what you want in your life. So I think the most important thing is that understanding how magic works, because it's kind of like if you're playing with electricity and you don't know how it works, you might start a fire and then that fire can grow out of control. So in magic, you work with the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water. We know this all the way back in ancient Greece when Aristotle talked about it. And we learned that we are made up of those elements. And then one more, which is spirit, which is why humans have sentience and the ability to know good from evil. So one thing that I do every day that I think is very easy for anyone of any level is doing a cleansing meditation. And I like doing it in the shower because I love hot showers. So when you are standing in the shower, imagining, imagining those, those rays of water as rays of light. I like to do a bright white light. Some people like blue. Some people like yellow. And then imagining all of the dirt, astral dirt, physical dirt coming off of your body and swirling down the drain. And that's the most important part. you got to send it away from you. And a lot of people go, Pythian, well, what is that? That's just my right. imagination. But imagination is what makes us very special because imagination is will. Uh, hold on. I have this quote. I have this quote memorized. All right. Visualization is imagination under will. Ooh, that's good. That is good. And yes, that is one of the things I practically preach too. We need imagination. We lost it when they take it out of kids. They make everything so logic based that this one plus one equals two, all left brain stuff. And I, let kids have their imaginary friends because not all of them are imaginary, number one. And number two, I, I work with the Hollywood Arts Council right here in town since we're all Hollywood girls. Um, and we put art into schools because the second the, the school districts, they had no money for art. So they took art out of schools. Their math skills went down. Their reading scores went down. Everything went down because they took away art and their imagination. So it, we bring back that mystery, that mysticism, the magic to the world. So that is beautiful. Good quote. Thank you. <laughs> so, and I love that because water, it is the water element, it is emotions and you're cleansing. So I do a lot with water myself. Yeah, water is one of my favorite elements. I I love working with water and I love working with earth. Both of the passive <laughs> the <Yeah>. passive elements. <laughs> right. Um so if people want to find your school, what kind of things do you teach in your school? Is it a, like a continuing program where somebody gets to a space? Is there one-off classes or individual classes? So what's really great about Pythian Mystery School is that it's a 
self-paced magical school. You are not required to follow along with me at any point. You can go at your own pace. And I teach uh, two levels. We have beginners or introductions, and then we have more advanced teachings. But I, I teach as much as I can, particularly, you know, tarot's big for me. I love auras. Auras was one of the first things that I got into when I was studying mysticism because that's a part of you and it's alive. Uh, I teach glamour magic, daily witch lessons, the moon cycles. And then when you get into the more advanced lessons, I teach about uh, history of the occult and more about what people like to call shadow work um, that's very popular right now. And of course, alchemy, which is one of the oldest traditions in the occult. Yes, yes. Oh, that is beautiful. Um, is it, it is most things online right now in the world of online world? <laughs> yeah, everything's online. So it's through patreon.com. You'll just look mm -hmm. up Pithy and Mystery School. Um, and the great thing is it's month to month subscription. So if you get too busy and you can't focus on it, you can always come back. It's always uh, an open door. Good. That is beautiful. So now we are we are in October. It is it is kind of our month. It is Samhain. Halloween for regular folks, Samhain for us. Do you have any special practices you do for this time of year or, or noticing oh. things what's going on? And so I have to be really careful during this uh, as we go into the dark months of the year because uh, my house is a portal. There's a lot of stuff that comes in and out of here and I have to protect it. Otherwise, like they're not literally goblins and ghouls, but things will come take residence where they're not supposed to. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to do a lot of extra protection work. Uh, but during this time, I like to work with my uh, deceased loved ones or my ancestors. And the way that I do that is creating um, a sacred space. And as you talked about the witching hour, it's good to do this really late at night when the veil is a little thinner. And I cook them a meal that they love to bring a candy bar. And then I, I sit with a candle and I meditate on their, their photo. And when I, you can feel their energy when they come in because, you know, everyone's got their own feeling. Um, and then I will use tarot cards to connect with them and ask questions about my life or things that I need more clarification or, or just to say hi. And what's really wild is after I finish this, um, I will often get dreams with my deceased loved ones. Yeah, is this the time? The veil is thin, so and this is the time. And yes, there are kind of ghouly and gobliny things. I mean, that is why in the regular mundane world, the Muggle world, you know, people dress up and you put on ghoul and costumes, and they put out the jack o' lanterns and the things to scare away the bad spirits. So we do have to be extra careful, especially those of us who are gifted, who have the site or are opening up the site to uh, the portals we create and work with. Yeah, it's really important that we, when we're not using those portals, to close them. That was one of my biggest mistakes when I first started out, is that I didn't always close my portal. And oh my gosh, electricity would go wild, things would break. And I'd be like, what the heck is happening? Why why are all these crazy things? I'm like, oh, oh, you didn't shut the door to the other side. Oops. <laughs> yeah, yep. Oops. Who are you? Go home. Yeah. <laughs> so I love it. Speaking of all the other side and stuff, and I, I'm very much in the paranormal and the ghosty world from all my years of work with uh, on Ghost Adventures with Zach and the guys and, and all my stuff now. So you spent a couple years as a, how, as a ghost hunter yourself. How does that tie? I love, because I love bringing magic and witchcraft and spirituality into paranormal stuff. Because so many people just, I want to be a ghost hunter and paranormal. They don't have any kind of a background or belief system or understanding. So how was your, how was your, your stint as a ghost hunter? Oops. Whoops. The kitty knocked <laughs> over my vase of flowers. Uh -oh. um, so, you know, being a ghost hunter, I lived in St. Augustine, Florida, which is, according to, I think, USA Today, the third most haunted city in the United States. And I went to college there at Flagler College, which was super haunted. Um, and as, as a young occultist who didn't really have a lot of um, a lot of discipline over my abilities, I was seeing ghosts everywhere. And I was like, OK. How do I learn to manage this? And there was a job available to me at the time to be a ghost hunter and a ghost tour guide. And I worked for a company called Ghost and Gravestones. And whew, that taught me protection right away because I guess it's like trial by fire. And like, I was like, oh, this is going to help me. Oh, no, no. I just threw myself into the flames and had to figure it out the hard way. <laughs> 
because um, what we would do is um, the whole city is haunted, uh, the old city, the beach area, but in particular, something called the old jail. And the old jail was active until 1959. That's when the last hanging happened, which is, yeah, there was a guillotine there. I mean, it was just like totally horrid. And I would have to go in there late, late at night, two or three o'clock in the morning um, with other, you know, tour guides and ghost hunters. And that the ghost world is spirituality whether or not people recognize that is like their prerogative but whenever you're communicating with something on the other side it's really important to protect yourself because not everything has your best intentions not at all i i and i love that again that's when people like you or me come into it i that's you're teaching them that because i think a lot of people who do get involved and want to go see ghosts they're looking for the mystery, like we were just talking about the mysticism of life, and they're not sure about spir- spirituality or religion or pagan or anything like that, but they want to see what's on the other side. So it's actually a path in that c- can lead people, um, but so many of them don't know what to do when they come across something that maybe doesn't have their best interest. They start to learn, and over the last 10 years, um, even almost all the shows learn, you don't scream at the ghost, you talk to the ghost. They're learning along the way. Um, but I, I'm really working with some of the guys. I work with some of the YouTube guys and, and really teaching them how to do it and do it, profe- you know, correctly. And I'm actually teaching them to lift the veil. So what wow. I say is like, yeah, it, you know, carefully and respectfully. So it's like what my job, I say, I, I keep them safe while I throw them off the roof. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's so important is to do it respectfully. Like you're right. Don't yell. Like, yeah, you're going to get a reaction, but is it a good reaction? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, one of the one of the stories we had in there was a, a very ardent disbeliever who and I was just kind of like, why why are you here, dude? Like, why why did you come here? But he was mocking one of the prisoners who was there, and then you heard this like yeah from him, and he got scratched, and it was it was a deep scratch on his thigh. And it's like, okay, well, now you've learned we don't mock spirits. Yeah, we don't. I mean, people don't want to be mocked. If you want somebody to talk to you, you talk to them nicely. The only pl- time I've ever, you know, and I go because ghost hunting, they, they, I like to hang out where the ghosts are swinging from the chandeliers and having a good time and hanging out because they can. But t- that's not what TV, TV wants you to go to the, the insane asylum, the prison, like you say, the serial killer's house. And and the, anytime I've had bad experiences, it's just because I let my guard down or I let somebody get disrespectful. I, really, that's when I, you know, people bursting into flames or I've been so hard thrown into a, a chair that I, you know, ripped. I didn't break my ribs. It sounded like breaking, but all the cartilage ripped off my ribs. I mean, it, it is serious world out there. So and it, it's respect, respect and understanding yeah. what you're, you know, doing. And if you're respectful, the spirits will be respectful to you as well. So because of this two-year stint as working as a ghost hunter, I got touched way too much. Hair, like hair got lifted, skirts got lifted. And I was like, okay, you know what? Like now I have trauma and any of the spirits that I work with in my home. And I'm like, you know what? I love you. I respect you. Don't touch me. You want my attention? I want you to move something safely within my home. So now my trash can is haunted. I've got <laughs> one, one of those swinging trash cans. When you, So whenever they want to talk to me and my trash can, and people have seen it, will just start swinging by itself. I'm like, oh, I, I got to go talk to someone. I'll be right back. That is kind of brilliant, my friend. That is brilliant. Talk to the trash can. <laughs> talk to the can. Talk to the hand. Don't, don't talk to the hand. Oh, I love that. Um, Yeah, we do. And we do set the boundaries. I firmly believe in all this world that we know, uh, deities, spirits, this, that other side of the veil. This is our realm of existence. I believe this is our realm and we and they will obey us. They will play by our rules. But people don't know that. So we give away our power. We tend to give away our power anyway in our everything to other people, to fear, to limiting belief systems. And they give away their power to ghosts. Just you can set boundaries exactly like that. I love the trash can idea. It's like, you know, don't bother me at night. Grandma, great. I love talking to you, but don't bother me at night. (laughs) Yeah. One of the other things that I have is I have their sigils on the wall and I have it with gaff tape. For those of you who don't know, gaff tape is what we use in the film world. So it's kind of like our duct tape, but better. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, 
And um, if you want to talk to me, those sigils will fall off the wall. And I'm like, okay, it's time to talk. But like, I just don't touch me. Don't ever touch me. Oh, that's, that is good. I have a, in my house, I have, again, active house as well. I have a 100 year old, 1920, actually just turned 100 this year, little bungalow in the Hollywood Hills. And it came with the spirit. It came with a French ghost. Her name is Adrian. And because the house was kind of abandoned and her artwork was here. It was like a little shrine to her. The tie dye she had made in the 60s was here. The paintings from the 70s, her disco music her whatever from the 80s. So it's it's like a little shrine. I put up her pictures. I do things, but she will do things. She's funny and protective, but like she got, we had a flood years ago. We first moved in and we had to move out. She was so mad at us for moving out. She started taking pictures out of frames. It's like, and even my husband, who just doesn't quite get all this, he's, it's like, but it it's, it's gaffer taped up. It's, you know, it's yeah. And the picture's nowhere in it. And the picture's on the floor that was broken. So, but she's never touched. I, maybe that's the female thing versus, mm-hmm. you know, t- there's, there's boundaries there. Cause again, if you're getting touched and you're at some old prison or some old jail, it's different. It's a, and again, from a different day and age, from a different time when women were treated differently than men. I just got back from, um, Vulture City, Paracon, which is an old mining town, where again, they, women were one thing, there's the brothel next to the thing, and there's all these miners and the women. It's like, they didn't really know how to treat girls so well, you know? Oh, I've got a mining town story. Oh, oh. tell us. So my boyfriend and I went to Calico uh, in July of this year, and they have these houses built into the side of the mountain. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, I want to I wanna go up and look. And like, we got closer. I was like, ooh. I don't know, but like, I want to be brave. I'm going to go look at the house. And when we got there and we peeked in, I felt something grab my ankle and actually pull me. And I fell on the ground and I was so scared because I like, you know, that's totally out of the blue. It wasn't okay. I let my guard down. Um, and he does Reiki. So he was able to like remove all of like the, the cords that it tried to attach to me. But yeah, mining towns are, are rough. Yeah. They are rough because it well and 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 in in the West Coast we don't have a bunch of old stuff. In the East Coast there's old buildings and two hundred year old buildings and three hundred year old buildings. We don't have that. Europe even older, but here the oldest thing we have are the mining towns. That's who came out first. Mm-hmm. And and I also believe very much big in life, big in death. You know, if you're totally. the quiet little secretary in life, you're the quiet little secretary in death. If you're a big person like a, a star, a movie star, or a miner who's coming out to make their fortune or a cow, big in life, big in death and that different personalities. It's it's wacky. And, and almost all, when you do ghost things here in California, you're, you're at Virginia City or Nevada City or Vulture City. It's like, yeah, going back to one of those cowboy towns. Ah. Yeah, I, I totally know what you mean by big in life, big in death. So in St. Augustine, there is a 500-year-old fort that you can still go visit today. But you can actually, if you sit out there at nighttime, sometimes you'll see soldiers who still have their lanterns who are patrolling, looking for enemy ships. And wow. like they, that's just their job. And you're right. That's like some, some of us, when we die, we get so attached to that identity that it's hard for us to move on. Right. Right. And so it, it, yeah. They do, I, the one place, have you ever been to Gettysburg? I, that's one place that's high on my list. And I've, I haven't been there. I don't even know why. I'm not like a history person or a war person. But there, I've just always been drawn. You know, maybe I was there once. I don't know. But, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't been to Gettysburg. But I did have a past life in the Civil War. Um, my, so I was a woman who lived in the South. And I was really, really poor. Um, I didn't have money to, you know, and this is like not okay now, but I didn't have slaves or anything like that. So I lived alone poor and my son got pulled into the army and I was so angry. Um, and I actually like, I died in the field when I was doing, um, when I was gardening. Um, and that's something that like, you know, I had to work through in this life is the anger and the hate. Um, it's really interesting to find that you get drawn to periods like that in your life. Um, and for me in particular, uh, ancient Egypt was my big one in this life. 
that just so shows. I love that. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, and I and I I love past life work. I actually just taught a past life regression class last night, and I kind of explained to people, and we did a work that it explained so much, like how you had to deal with anger issues in this life. Um, I know the first one I did decades ago. Um, I, I've, always, I'm, always, I'm actually for being this kind of a woo woo person. I'm really logical, and I'm, I don't have any un- illogical fears about things. But I've always been afraid of railroad tracks mm. and armored cars for no reason. I mean, armored cars, yeah, they're scary guys with guns in there. But just this irrational f- f- fear of that. The horses are a little weird for me. And L.A., railroad trucks, most of them haven't seen a train in 100 years. But it's still like, ah, going over it. And my first past life regression ever, I was young. I was in college. I was like a cowboy and robbing I guess like the Wells Fargo, whatever on a train and <laughs> it, all my fears came. I understood why the fear of the railroad tracks and the fear of the weirdness about horses and the armored cars and all that. And those fears went away. So that's what it's like dealing with it, understanding. So, you know, maybe, maybe I do need to get to Gettysburg to resolve something from, you know, a lifetime even before that. Yeah. I totally know what you mean. Like, like having to to confront those fears. I have a big fear of childbirth and ah. That came from my life in the 1920s where I had, um, yeah, I was working in Hollywood. Um, so shocker, I'm back. <laughs> we and, probably uh, knew each other. Oh, that's so fun. I would love to think that. Oh, and, um, you know, I had, um, a forced abortion and like from that, I, I still am working through that fear. It's super, super hard for me, but like, it was really strange. I knew as a child, I never wanted to have birth children. I want to adopt kids. Um, but when I did that past life regression, like it all came flooding back. And, you know, during those, those years, it wasn't safe. It was, it was very back alley, very scary. And like that trauma still is here with me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's funny. I, I think there's a lot of us in Hollywood right now who are from that decade. I, I was, and it took me a long time because I started out kind of skeptical, like, yeah, yeah, everybody's somebody. And they told me who I was, but I found the house without knowing the address. I've been in the house, knew every inch of it. We have all these similarities. She was born, died at 30. I was born exactly 30 years later. I didn't die at 30, but I came even more into my power. So it was interesting, but it's a lot of us are back now that we're here then. I maybe because that was the birthing of Hollywood, what it is now. And now it's a whole other maybe we're gonna now we're bringing (laughs) maybe we're gonna fix it yeah that's it we're gonna fix hollywood you and me ashley let's go um yeah, I, I like that. silent black films like it's so interesting when i was doing you know this gets not quite magical but um in the 1920s women were the writers and the directors Yes, I know. Um, next door to my house was Mary Pickford's, her dressing room, not her house, her big house pick fair. Her dressing room is next door to my house. She, she was a she was a powerhouse. My God. Even the person that I was, Barbara Lamar, she, they wrote, they direct, they did everything. And then I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. That, I think the World War II happened. I guess that's what happened. Yeah. Um, I keep looking at your beautiful pink Ouija earrings. I'm a big Ouija girl. I've been using them safely since I was seven or eight years old. Um, so what's your thought? I know Ouija uh, brings up so much in people. What's your thought on Ouija boards? I think it's like T9 texting. <laughs> it takes a long time. Um, I like Ouija boards. I love the, um, I love the aesthetic. I, I love the, so a lot of people say like, oh, Pythian, but Ouija boards weren't really around until nine, uh, 1890. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. That's when they were popularized and commercialized, but spirit boards have been around for centuries. Um, and you're right, Patty, there are safe ways to use them. And as a, including a space of protection and making sure that you have your guides there to communicate. And it, it's a lot of fun. I think that there's nothing quite as amazing as being able to have that experience with people safely. Uh, but I personally think it takes too long. Maybe I'm just impatient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it can very definitely take a long time. But it is fun. What I've been actually using over a Ouija board is chalkboard, a, a planchette that's got chalk in it. Mm-hmm. Because spelling seems to go out the door with death or else people just don't know how to spell. It's like, is that phonetic? (laughs) You know, you can't figure it out what you're trying to do. Or a lot of people don't speak English. They just don't. Especially Mm -hmm. we are talking to people. It's like we just expect them to know. They they don't. So I started using a friend of mine, uh, 
Dan Coda, he just left LA for Niagara Falls. He invents all these great things. And he just put this, this piece of chalk into a planchette. Oh my heavens. They write in other languages. They draw, they oh. make shapes, they make sigils, they make symbols. I've had uh, from, I've had a perfect Virgin Mary drawn with the ropes and the uh, robes and the whole thing. In I'm talking in the dark with you know three or four of people with their fingers onto this little planchette moving. I uh, had I've had a perfect rat draw. I mean a perfect like was drawn like traced by an artist a rat drawn when somebody was talking about the White House a year or two ago. Um, <laughs> it was a White House correspondent. But yeah, I'm loving the ch- and it's much faster than Luigi because I'm I'm always in a hurry too and I'm not real big on patience of things. Oh, that's so cool! What an amazing what an amazing tool to use. It is. Because that's what and I know when when spirit boards, I know we both know histories of things, you know, they, they were using pencils and things like that. So that's just a nice modern version of, of making it happen. And they don't have to find the R and find the I and find the hello and find the goodbye and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think it's really important to, to understand that, you know, as technology evolves, so does magic. Like it's not that's why I think it's funny when people like poo poo on things that maybe are a little bit newer, maybe only a couple centuries old. That doesn't make it any less legitimate. No. And again, going back to the ghost hunting world, this equipment they're inventing is amazing Uh, because everything's energy. We know that we're energy. Spirits are energy conduit. Electricity is a great conduit for energy. And um, all these little ghost meters and SLS cameras. It's, I mean, the first time I saw, I think Zach and the guys use the SLS camera because I, for decades, have been going, oh, yeah, the ghost is going like this and put his hands in front of his house. But they, it had, they either believe me or think I'm crazy. Now there's some guy in another room. We have no contact with each other showing a little green stick figure going exactly what I'm saying. It's like, yes, that's what I've been seeing. So I love that technology, modern stuff is catching up. And cell phones, cell phones are, my, I always say my cell phone's haunted because it is. It is. Yep. Yeah. I know. Okay. So this is a, I sometimes there's a, a specific entity in a different pantheon that I work, than I work with. And she comes in every now and then, especially when they maybe I'm doing something kind of dumb or like I'm not being my best self and it will like for no reason whatsoever, her name shows up on my text. And it's like, I don't text this word. This is not in my like auto correct. And I'm like, okay, okay. I hear you. I respond. And the other thing about, um, you know, cell phones, that these are also energy. Yeah. Completely. I know. I, uh, it, 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 the little apps you could use work if you want that. But I got a call. This is several months ago now. But on my little cell phone, it said, uh, call from David Coleman, my husband's best friend, his bandmate, who's been dead five years. And oh. I, I'm like, oh. Okay, answer it. There wasn't anybody there. And it, it was like a blank. It wasn't. And I'm like, well, maybe it could be a still phone number from his wife or something like that. D- dialed it right up. It was a disconnected number, but he just felt like checking in. Oh my God. <laughs> it was great. That's yeah, so cool. that was. So I've been working on this idea for a while and I've been kind of scared to share it because maybe it's dumb, but I want to share it with you and see what you think. So, Please do. This is a safe and sacred place. Nothing's too dumb. So emojis are our first universal language that we've ever had. And Mm -hmm. so I just got goosebumps. Yeah. And I think emoji magic is a real thing because we can create symbols because our, our unconscious mind only works in symbols. It doesn't work in language. So when you are texting something or if you want to, to send out like a mini spell, I use emojis. You know, I put the little sparklies and then I put like my intention. I always write it in present tense. Like I am, let's just say I am healthy. And then I will add like an apple and a workout and then I send it to myself. I'll send it to like my iMessage. And then what I do is I delete it. So like I am doing the exact spell ritual where you send it out and then you let it go. And it, I think it works. And I think that's something that a lot of people could do. Oh my gosh! That I, another. I, it's not dumb. That's freaking brilliant. Oh, I'm gonna go do some emoji magic. Emoji. Write a book, Ashley. Yeah. Emoji magic by Ashley. I like that. Really like that. Um. Anyway. Oh my gosh. I'm looking at the clock. I, I, I'm gonna have to have you come back because I haven't gotten to any of my questions. Will you come back another day and of course visit I'll us? Yes. So um. So but before we wrap up, please tell everybody where they can find you. Are you oh, tell them about your your podcast, 
your website, your everything. Ah, thank you. So if you are interested in learning from me, you can find me on patreon.com at Pythian Mystery School. I'm on TikTok and Instagram as Pythian, and I'm going to spell that out for you. So it's P-Y-T-H-I-A-N Priestess, which is spelled P-R-I-E-S-T-E-S-S. And my podcast, which will be launching in February of 2022, oh my gosh, <laughs> uh, it's called The Occult Unveiled, which Patty is featured in, where we talk to real practitioners about their practice and unveil the mysteries of the occult. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> oh, very so exciting. Ch- so check her out. So Pythian Pri- Priestess and, and your website wise, same thing, go there. Yep, it's just pythianpriestess.com. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Ashley. Everybody, thank Ashley. Check her out. Go to her website. Follow her on social media. Check out her school. Um, She's good peeps. I can see that. So thank you so much for joining us on The Witching Hour. Uh, Thank you, Patty, and thanks thanks to all the listeners. Paranormal Network.